Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all you guys tonight for a good spirited debate about the, the weather, or otherwise known as climate change. I, uh, there are three rules, I'm sorry, two rules to the College of Complexes. First is one fool at a time, and second is no personal attacks. Oh, oh, yeah, right. The format tonight will consist of the following. We'll have two speakers, each going about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have a question and answer period after that, along with our rebuttal period. I'd like to have our supposed moderator come on up and introduce himself tonight, because he's graciously volunteered to help moderate the questions. Uh, just as a quick, uh, I forget your name, sir. Vic. Vic. So Vic will be moderating and Shirley will be helping out with the intros. Now, after our speakers who speak, uh, after the speakers who speak, we will then have our question and answer period. Then we we'll should be able to uh, have our infamous rebuttals where you get a chance to speak against the speakers on our off topics and the speakers will get the last word. We have to be out of here by about 8.45 so that the restaurant can get cleaned up. The honor to the introduction. We have two seasoned speaker, veteran speakers here uh, at the College of Campuses. We've spoken on uh, several occasions uh, and we're going to be, topic came up, uh, I've been reading some of the literature on what's wrong with the weather. I believe it was on Christmas that the temperature was something like 60 some degrees. Uh, and irregularities in the weather. And we put a, a request out to speakers and we got two responses uh, by uh, the following individuals. But first we're gonna listen um, to, actually they're gonna give us a little unconventional perspectives. Uh, I know a lot of you are in, affiliated with green issues and familiar with some of the things that have been said, but uh, let's, uh, to generate conversation, we're going to have Ted Aranda speak first on climate change, followed by, uh, um, where is he? Is he's, it, um, he's right there. David Ramsey Steele, author of several books, he spoke here, it was two weeks ago, I think. Uh, so, okay, let's welcome vote. We're going to give about half an hour and we're going to allot to each one, followed by traditional questions. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yay. Yay. All right. Hi, Charlie. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, two subtopics of this larger issue of weird weather, <clears throat> and that's chemtrails and global warming. So um, the weather obviously has to do with the state of the atmosphere, and largely uh, about whether or not it's clear uh, or cloudy or, and what kinds of clouds. And by the way, I'm going to move fairly quickly because I only have half an hour, and this is a large subject. So weather is in large part about the sky, the sky and clouds, what they're, what they're like. So if the nature of the sky and clouds is being artificially manipulated or altered, then the weather is certainly being altered. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about how, because I don't have time to begin with. And secondly, I'm more interested in, in just the bare fact that it's being done, not so much the various ways that it's being done. <clears throat> so the question is, what are these things that we see nowadays in the sky, these lines, Okay, some thin, some thick. Um, are those chemtrails, chemical trails, or contrails, condensation trails? Those are two very, very different things. Okay. <clears throat> and before we go on, um, I'm going to make a note that I use the term chemtrails. Uh, this term geoengineering is also popular, uh, partly because it makes the things seem more scientific, you know, because there's engineering. And then the word geo means comprehensive, so it sounds like a, a rational, comprehensive, scientific program, if you use the term geoengineering. But that's speculative at best, and as a matter of fact, I don't believe that's what uh, is going on. This scientist, Marvin Herndon, a perfectly respectable scientist, um, 
found out that the chemtrail material is actually coal fly ash, the uh, toxic waste from uh, toxic from coal plants. <clears throat> he uh, compared the material that's in coal fly ash and the, uh, the material in the air after um, chemtrailing, and he found out that it's essentially the same material. This is this is what he says. This is strong evidence that the substance in place into the troposphere is coal fly ash at a 99% confidence interval. So this stuff is basically um, this stuff. Coal fly ash, toxic waste from coal power plants. They probably uh, add various other things as well. <clears throat> probably they, probably uh, a material to whiten it. This is the stuff in mountains outside of coal plants, and they have to get rid of this stuff somehow. But if they got rid of it, um, it properly, uh, safely, it would cost an absolute mountain of money, okay, that, that they, even these large corporations don't have. So they're dumping it in the air. That's what that stuff is, more or less, okay, for the most part, I should say. Another purpose of chemtrailing um, is uh, a military program. This is a publication uh, accepted by the uh, U.S. military weather as a force multiplier, owning the weather in 2025. <clears throat> and this is partly what it says. In 2025, U.S. aerospace forces can own the weather by capitalizing on emerging technologies and developing a strategy for the use of a future weather modification system to achieve military objectives. So they're messing with the weather also uh, for military purposes. And this is the, the kind of thing that they can do. Precipitation enhancement, storm enhancement, precipitation denial, fog and cloud removal, etc., etc., etc. They can mess with the weather all kinds of ways. And uh, to some degree or other, they're doing it. Um, another uh, term used, or a couple of other terms used uh, for chemtrails, is stratospheric aerosol injection and solar radiation management. I don't use those terms partly because they're just in inaccurate. They're wrong. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, stratospheric aerosol geoengineering is a program of spraying that would be done in the stratosphere. Okay, the troposphere is the first layer of the atmosphere. Um, the stratosphere is the layer above it. It's very, very high. Um, and the chemtrailing that we see is being done by ordinary planes, airliner-type planes, in the troposphere. It's too low, okay? So that's not what's going on. Chemtrailing uh, is being done in the troposphere, so it can't possibly be stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. All the models and all the plans are for much higher spraying. Okay. Uh, so I already did a, a, a um, presentation a couple years ago on chemtrails, and I presented a whole lot of evidence, and uh, obviously I'm not going to go through it all again right now, but I do want to um, go through a couple. And one of these pieces of evidence, clear cut, okay, is broken trails. This is to prove that those are chemtrails, they're not condensation trails. Here is um, one such case where uh, what appears to be happening is that there's a cell of air if this was a condensation trail, what this would mean is that, uh, if, let's say the plane was going this way, right here, the uh, uh, condensation would have cut off, okay? The, the uh, mechanism that was causing this trail would have cut off on a dime instantly, and then uh, returned instantly, as if there was a bubble of air with sharp edges. Imagine a bubble, an ordinary bubble, but of air with sharp edges, okay? That's not how nature is. That's not how the atmosphere is. Charlie, no? No, no, no. I just, just, okay. I might signal okay. that. <laughs> okay. Um, that's not how the atmosphere is. It's a fluid, okay? Uh, it's, it's not, you don't have uh, po pockets of air with such uh, uh, radically different uh, properties from a material just a foot away, okay? So that's com uh, that, that shows, this shows that what's happening is that the chemtrail, it's a chemtrail and it's being turned off, the spring is being turned off and back on. Are you ready? Yeah. And you see um, this clear as day when you see uh, uh, videos like this that show the uh, uh, broken trails being laid, okay, the chemtrailing being turned on and off. You can see numerous um, uh, videos like this, okay? And this, in this, this particular video, this person that um, posted it uh, said that he thinks it's a, uh, the pilot or whoever was controlling the chemtrails was sending a signal to the world, uh, uh, you know, whistleblowing, because this is obviously not natural. You know, if this was a condensation trail, it wouldn't be turning on and off. The engines aren't being turned on and off, or the plane would fall out of the sky. <clears throat> so uh, clearly, the chemtrail, the chemtrails, and they're being turned on and off. That's proof. I mean, I, I don't, I haven't heard anybody uh, 
to explain how this can happen with natural condensation. But, um, so that's what's going on there. Uh, another uh, very strong piece of evidence has to do with humidity. So these are photographs that I took just a, a little over a month ago, January 6th, um, from the south side, um, the middle of Washington Park, um, just a little west of High Park. And this is facing north. That's the uh, Sears Tower right there. And I went around the sky, excuse me, around the horizon, 360 degrees, taking photographs, okay? And starting from the north. So what this looks like, um, this sky, is a mostly clear sky with some cirrus clouds, okay? That's what it looks like. This is the highest concentration right here. Um, only one problem. Um, these are not cirrus clouds. They're not natural clouds at all. And that can be demonstrated because uh, the sky was too dry. Cirrus clouds uh, form way up high, um, and, and they, can't, they can't form in such a dry sky. This is brown, this brown right here, okay? That's um, uh, almost, uh, uh, well, that, that's completely dry right here. Um, this is Chicago. It's just one level away from very dry. The dry. It's a very dry, 10 to 20% uh, percent relative humidity. And this is, uh, and this is uh, an enlargement of, of, of this photograph here, of this uh, image. So this is a typical uh, weather system coming from the northwest. Okay, in the old days, before chemtrailing, this would be a, a clear blue sky. You would have a clear blue sky because this, the, uh, uh, where the clouds are, uh, the you know, upper atmosphere, uh, or the upper troposphere, I should say, it's way too dry for, for cirrus clouds to form. It should be a clear blue sky. A cirrus clouds. The air needs to be co cold and humid for cirrus clouds to form. This explains the high concentration of cirrus clouds near the tropics. The warm air in the tropics travels up to humidify the cold upper troposphere, resulting in plentiful amounts of cirrus. And this is very basic meteorology, okay? Uh, so that's why you can have uh, 40 to 50 percent um, cirrus cloud frequency in the tropics, okay? Up where we are at our latitude, Chicago, uh, it's only 10 to 20 percent. So cirrus clouds in our climate, you know, naturally, uh, are relatively rare. So what does this have to do with contrails? Well, spreading contrails, when a actual water vapor con condensation trails spread, uh, they do so uh, through the same mechanism for the same reasons that cirrus clouds form, okay? In other words, um, you have to have high humidity, 70% or, or, or so. Persistent contrails can occur, but do so only in certain specific atmospheric conditions. Uh, as I said, 70% uh, humidity or, or, or more humid, and usually in the vicinity of existing cirrus clouds. How do contrails form? Aeroplane jet engines produce water vapor as a byproduct of burning fuel. Above 20,000 feet, the air surrounding the aircraft is well below freezing, so it cools down the water vapor coming out of the back of the engines. This causes the water vapor to condense rapidly and then freeze. What happens next depends on how dry or how humid the air is. If the air is very dry, the ice crystals will sublime, that is, change phase directly from solid to gas, and become invisible. If the air is humid, the water droplets or ice crystals will stay where they are and, off, and will stay where they are, often spreading and often mixing with cirrus cloud. Okay, so they can't be uh, cirrus clouds in this uh, dry air. And when you, I'm going to go through these photographs again. And when you look for the signs of chemtrailing, you see them all over. These linear things, okay, that's not a cloud. That's an old chemtrail going around this right here is a segment of an old chemtrail, like, kind of like we saw here, except it's a little older, okay? This edge right here, going through this alleged cloud, this uh, uh, supposed cloud, that's not a natural cloud, that's a chem cloud. All of the stuff in the sky here is artificial, it's mostly aluminum, it's not a natural cloud. That sharp edge happens when a plane goes through an existing chem cloud, that, that's not what happens when planes go through natural clouds. They don't leave channels with sharp edges, okay? Uh, going around, uh, now we're facing south, down here, all right? Uh, I uh, magnified it, okay? Look, that's chemtrails. That's a chemtrail right there. Being laid, right, the plane might be right there, as a matter of fact. And this is an old chemtrail. So this sky is a product of chemtrailing, all right? It's not a natural sky at all. And the reason, one of the reasons that I'm showing you these first is to sh show that um, this is the norm now. This is the new normal. Okay, we don't have uh, artificial uh, sky, excuse me, we don't have natural skies anymore for the most part, okay? Um, this, is, this is routine now. Uh, people will come out and, and say, people who don't know any better, would come out and say, oh, a nice day, nice sky, nice clouds. It's a, it's a, it's a chem sky, chem clouds. 
But oftentimes it's much more obvious than that. Completely brazen, okay? Like, yeah, chemtrails uh, being laid over downtown Chicago in the middle of the loop at Staten Lake, okay? This is over Michigan Avenue. This, these are two shots on the same day. Can anybody who knows anything about um, the atmosphere um, or condensation trails claim that that's, those are condensation trails? No, th that, those are chemtrails, clear as day, okay? Here uh, on this morning, I took uh, this shot that shows the evolution of these chemtrails. This is a chemtrail just a, a couple minutes old. This one here is a few minutes old, like 15 minutes old or something. And this is, um, an, you know, half an hour, an hour, or whatever. That's what these things uh, turn into, okay? That's what this was that we just saw, okay? Those are, um, that's, those are chem clouds. They're the result of chemtrails. That's how they evolve, they spread. Uh, 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 natural contrails, uh, they don't spread like that. They become invisible, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, this is another day. I have tons of photographs like this. Uh, these are two shots from the same day. And here you have chemtrails, chemtrails, okay, chemtrails, older chemtrails, segments of chemtrails, and that's, this is the sky that they uh, result in. This is the sky that they produce, a chem sky, an artificial sky. Okay. No, it's not natural. I'm, just, I'm explaining exactly why it's not natural. This here is a, is a fat chemtrail, okay? Um, and this is the, the, the chem sky, the chem clouds. This is an artificial sky. It should be a, a, a blue sky. It should be a clear blue sky. Okay, um, this right here um, is uh, a juxtaposition of the two types of clouds, a natural cumulus cloud. And this here is a chem cloud mimicking the cirrus. You don't, in nature, you don't have two uh, layers of clouds, one very low and one very high, completely separate, and, uh, and you know, in the same sky. That's unnatural. Where did you make this picture? This was at near O'Hare, that particular one. This here is outside of uh, my um, apartment window, okay? Left to right, two shots. These are natural cumulus clouds down here, and these are chem clouds. And usually, if you, especially if you pay attention for a period of time, you see these things being developed. You see, you see the planes come in, spray, uh, the things spread out, and if you watch carefully and you watch over a period of an hour or two, you see them turn into this, this crap here, okay, in front of your eyes. Okay, so this is not speculation. This is just observation, okay? I'll get to that. Uh, or if you can ask me later. Okay. So anyway, so um, now this here, uh, if, this, if these natural uh, uh, cumulus clouds weren't in the sky, okay, you might think this is just uh, an overcast uh, strato, stratus cloud sky. No, this is a chem sky. It's a thick layer of chem gunk, mostly aluminum, again, okay? A nano, a nano particulates aerosol uh, having been sprayed. Same thing here. This is a set another day. There are the natural cumulus clouds, okay? This is a chem sky. And uh, with these kinds of photographs, with my camera and probably most cameras, it gives it a slightly blue tint. In real life, this is white. When you look at, you know, you see a white sky, an artificial sky. So clear blue skies like these, okay, with very bright sunshine that you can feel on your skin, okay, with maybe just a few uh, natural cumulus clouds, no chem gunk, no chem haze, no chem nothing, okay. Those long periods of time of this kind of sky are mostly gone. Okay, you, we can have a few hours of it, but then the chem uh, planes come in, uh, uh, you know, laying down the chemtrails and messing up the sky. We rarely have more than a day or two of, of, sky, of uh, this kind of sky. It's remarkable now, it's notable, that's why I took these photographs. And several days, like a whole, you know, up to like a week, the week which we used to have in the old days before chemtrailing, that's, that's the thing in the past. They have fucked up our skies, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. And, you know, it's demonstrable as I'm demonstrating right now. So, uh, as this says, imagine, if you will, a world run by psychopaths. The people in control are doing this, and they have screwed up our sky, to put it lightly. Okay? Now, one of the things to notice about this phenomenon of, of heavy camp drilling is it started uh, around the year 2000. This was Project Cloverleaf. Project Cloverleaf is a joint U.S.-Canadian military operation involving distributing chemicals into the atmosphere of both Canada and the United States. Uh, there had been cloud seeding and weather manipulation experiments before this time, but this was the first time that people started seeing these, you know, these lines in the sky, like I just showed you, months of spraying, 1998. Uh, heavy activity, 1999. This, is, this was when uh, chemtrailing started on a large scale. Okay, just make a note of that. 
So um, we have chemtrails in the sky for sure, right? Uh, uh, weather manipulation, let's call it geoengineering, whatever you want to call it. Therefore, global warming is a hoax, right? That's what they say. Very logical, right? No, it's completely illogical, completely irrational. It's not sequitur. It's just, it's just nonsense, okay? You can have apples and oranges existing in the same world, and we have chemtrails and global warming going on uh, simultaneously now, but chemtrails came along later. So, chemtrails um, certainly mess up our sky, again, in ways that I don't have time to get into, uh, with weather, uh, all kinds of uh, anomalous weather and weather events, okay? Um, CO2 uh, emissions, okay, carbon emissions, fossil fuel emissions, have been going on a lot longer than chemtrails, in fact, since uh, the second industrial revolution, or, uh, starting around 1870. And they, that, that's the main cause of global warming. Okay, not necessarily uh, specific anomalous weather uh, uh, um, uh, events, but global warming as a whole. This uh, kind of map nowadays is, is typical. This was December 2019. All this red and uh, yellow, dark, uh, dark yellow. That's all uh, extraordinarily warm weather, much warmer than than, than the norm. Okay, that that's typical now. That's what global warming is. Literally global warming, um, and that started with, as I said, depositing of. of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in huge amounts, uh, starting with industrial revolution, uh, industry, and automobiles. And in this graph here, you see this uh, line, this green line, that's fossil fuel emissions uh, that have been going up and up and up ever since um, the late 1800s. And this very light line down here at the bottom, that's volcanic emissions, okay, which have been constant. So around 1870, as you see here, um, uh, human emissions overtook volcanic emissions and have been going up, skyrocketing ever since. Uh, at this point in time, we have laid uh, 2,000 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, that's two teratons. There's megatons, gigatons, that's teratons, trillions of tons, okay? Two, ter two teratons. That's the equivalent of 400 billion elephants. Wait, of 400 billion elephants, which is unimaginable, right? That's a huge amount of carbon dioxide, and we can expect it to have an effect on, on our global climate and the atmosphere. So the science of global warming is as old as um, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, they started a long time ago. Scientists discovered before the year 1900 about uh, global warming. These are the grandfathers, uh, some of the grandfathers of uh, climate science, the global warming science, uh, Jean-Baptiste Fourier, uh, John Tyndall, Svantes Arginius, okay? These are all 19th century guys, okay? This is a meme going around. You can find a lot of variations of it. Um, these global scientists uh, deny, uh, excuse me, global warming deniers uh, claim that Al Gore invented uh, uh, global warming and that he's lying about it, and he's doing it to make hundreds of millions of dollars. All right. Whatever amount of money this guy is making, for whatever, however he makes it, he's, he's, he certainly is not uh, uh, lying about global warming, and he didn't invent the science of global warming. In 1896, the Swedish scientist Vontas Arrhenius published a new idea. By burning fossil fuels such as coal, thus adding carbon dioxide to Earth's atmosphere, humanity would raise the planet's average temperature. And this is the infamous greenhouse effect. And it's very basic science. Visible energy from the sun passes through the glass and heats the ground uh, you know, of a greenhouse. The, the uh, heat radiation rises and is trapped by the glass, the infrared heat energy, okay? And it warms the greenhouse. The same thing is happening with our Earth, okay? Uh, the sunlight passes through our transparent Earth, it warms the uh, surface of the Earth, and then the heat radiation rises and is, and is trapped by this heat blanket of greenhouse gases, okay? Um, so th this, uh, this is another scientist uh, from the 1930s, Guy Callender. And he began collecting measurements of the properties of gases, the structure of the atmosphere, the sunlight at different latitudes, the use of fossil fuels, the action of ocean currents, the temperature and rainfall in weather stations across the world, and a host of other factors. Uh, in 1938, he came to a surprising conclusion. People were dumping enough carbon dioxide into the air to raise the world's average temperature. Okay, this was already known way back okay, in the, in the uh, late 1930s. Uh, these are scientists using the scientific method of, ob of observation, measurement, analysis, and assessment based on the data. There's nothing fraudulent about 
global warming science. You know, they make mistakes. They make mistakes like everybody else. But this notion, is, uh, the, you know, it comes just out of the blue that, that global warming science is, is one big hoax. It's just ludicrous, okay? This is another um, a scientist, uh, Charles Keeling, who uh, started measuring the uh, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, very precisely starting in the 1950s, and of course, it's been rising ever since, or for a long time. So those were individual scientists, um, perfectly legitimate scientists. Uh, now you start in 1979, you have this large board, this large team of scientists, uh, Carbon Dioxide and Climate, a scientific assessment. This was sponsored by the National Academy of Sciences, 1979. And when you look at the research board, of, you know, scientists sponsoring this, they're uh, apparently, from all uh, uh, appearances, perfectly legitimate uh, scientists from perfectly legitimate uh, institutions. Yale University, University of Colorado, University of Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. The actual uh, scientists uh, doing the study, the uh, study group, okay? Uh, again, solid scientists from solid universities. And they came to this conclusion. Um, these concerns about carbon dioxide have prompted a number of investigations of the implications of increasing carbon dioxide. Their consensus has been that increasing carbon dioxide would lead to a warmer Earth with a different distribution of climatic regimes. In other words, global warming. That's what this team of scientists uh, determined. Another larger team of scientists, the 1985 uh, International uh, Gathering, um, made this uh, report, the assessment of the role of carbon dioxide and of other greenhouse gases in climate variations. Okay? This uh, gentleman made one of the speeches at this conference, and he said, he said, we have now laid aside most of the doubts as to the effect of the buildup of carbon dioxide and other trace gases on global climate. It is clear now that at current rates of buildup, a global mean annual temperature increase of several degrees will probably occur over a period of half a century or so. And I uh, copied the list of um, scientists involved. Uh, there are about 80 of them, okay? And they all come from perfectly respectable uh, universities. That these are all professors and, and PhDs, okay? Uh, you would think that these people know a few things about meteorology, given that they come from uh, institutes of meteorology, like this one here, Central Institute for Meteorology and Geodynamics. I think people like this probably know a few things about meteorology and geodynamics, okay? That's what this whole list is. Nothing but uh, uh, apparently perfectly legitimate uh, solid scientists doing solid science. So this was in 1985, and they were studying uh, what had been going on for a century already, the dumping of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the effect of, of that dumping, okay? This uh, phenomenon, large-scale uh, um, chemtrailing, was in the future. This hadn't happened when these people spoke, okay, and, and investigated. This started around the year 2000 on a large scale. So it's two, again, you'll recall this, so it's two different phenomena. Um, now, uh, the temperature and carbon, carbon dioxide levels as well have changed um, over the ages, okay, over the over thousands and millions of years. But look at this graph. This is 20,000 years, okay, uh, time, time lapse of 20,000 years. And this is uh, how gradual the, the changes occur naturally, okay? There are mechanisms that can uh, explain this, this, these kinds of changes, which I don't have time to go into, but this kind of change, uh, this spike, uh, that's a blink of an eye, geologically speaking, okay? That's when human, not only human civilization, but human industry arrived in the late 1800s, and it's a sharp, uh, tremendous spike in carbon dioxide levels, and, uh, well, here it's temperature specifically, but the same thing can be said about carbon dioxide. So we were actually on a trend, a cooling trend, okay, for the past few thousand years, um, and we were headed into an ice age. This earth was headed into another ice age until human industry came along and totally disrupted the natural uh, cycles. And this is uh, that, uh, this, uh, the change from the year 1880 in temperature, the rise in temperature, and you can see from 18, about 1870, it's been solid, a solid rise, okay? Um, here's that same graph, uh, that blue, okay, that blue line, uh, ragged line, okay, that's that, and, and carbon dioxide levels have risen in lockstep with temperature increase. Um, and here's that same temperature line, this black, uh, coupled with this red line, which is solar activity, okay, or rather solar irradiance, which is similar to solar activity. I mean, this is the strength of the sunlight, okay. So uh, global warming deniers were saying, well, it's the sun, it's not, CO, it's not uh, human CO2, it's the sun that's causing um, global warming, but this proves it uh, proves that that's false um, beyond doubt because the um, 
uh, strength of the sunlight has been uh, uh, leveled off and then started going down slightly, okay? At the very same time that the heat went up, okay? The temperature uh, kept climbing. So that's proof that it's uh, uh, global warming is due to carbon dioxide. So um, I don't have time to uh, show you, uh, all, there are all kinds of signs of, of global warming, okay? Physical uh, manifestations of global warming. Um, these are, are, I'll just show you one here. Glaciers melting all over the world. These are in Switzerland, okay? There's a glacier there, right? See this uh, building here and that um, road, okay? There's that building and that road. This is 100 years later. That glacier is gone, roughly 100 years. All right? Uh, this is another big glacier in another valley in Switzerland. Uh, roughly 100 years later, that glacier is gone, okay? Just a little pier of a glacier left there. This is another massive glacier. Now this this is unbelievable here. This is what it is today. Okay, that's hundreds of feet of ice. That's an enormous amount of ice, all gone. Where is that? This is Switzerland. And this is happening with glaciers all over the world. That's why it's called global warming because the Earth is melting. Okay, or ice on the Earth is melting. So we have a double whammy: chemtrails and global warming. It's not chemtrails or global warming. It's both a double whammy. Thank you. Okay. Our mics just closer that up put on the table. And then we'll turn off the projector. I'll turn off the projector because David Ramsey Steele is not going to need one. But we can turn it on later if we need it. Okay, David, if you're ready. We can always. Well, <coughs> fellow members of the human species, anybody else in the Can you use the mic, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, um, fix you a little bit. Talk to the mic. Okay. Is that good? They think so. All right. Is this good, too? Yes. Okay. Um, it would be fun to uh, dismantle presentation we've just heard, but I, I've got prepared remarks and I think I'll stick to them. I will only make this one remark because I can't resist it. Um, and that is that um, when the speaker dealt with global warming, he appealed to the very respectable credentials of the people who were advocating this. And I agree, lots of people with very respectable credentials do advocate the global warming hysteria. Uh, but it, when he was talking about the chemtrails, he didn't appeal to anybody who had respectable credentials, because you won't find anybody with respectable credentials who gives any heedance to this um, uh, to this chemtrails uh, story. But I'm uninfluenced by people's credentials. Um, I'm the little boy who saw that the emperor had no clothes. Um, I don't care about people's credentials. It doesn't intimidate me one bit. So what the, the topic is, what's wrong with the weather? Now, what I'm going to say to you is unfashionable, and you will find it outrageous. Uh, but you could perform this kind of mental experiment. Um, imagine that uh, the, re the recording of this, uh, of this meeting survives for 50 years. So um, in 2070, I, I assure you that if people look at this in 2070, and I was still speaking, they'll say, well, he's just saying what we all know. It's all obvious. Um, and uh, so things like global warming, they come and go. They're just uh, crazes and uh, uh, bouts of madness that, uh, that seize people. Um, and they eventually disappear. So what's wrong with the weather? Well, from a human point of view, the main thing wrong with the weather is that it's too cold. And we can see this very simply. Humans are tropical animals. They can't survive outside the tropics without artificial aids. So the artificial aids would be fire, or some other artificial means of heating, clothing, and buildings. Without those three artificial aids, humans just can't last uh, more than a few months outside the tropics, uh, certainly uh, winter outside the tropics. Uh, so. It's too cold for humans, so we may do with artificial aids. It would be much nicer uh, if the temperature were a lot higher. 
uh, it would be better for humans, it would be better for, the, for biodiversity, better in all ways. How do I, why do I say that with such confidence? Well, there have been many times in the history of the Earth where it's been much, much warmer than it is today. And uh, generally speaking, um, if we go back 50 million years, for example, there was no ice anywhere on the Earth. Uh, there was no ice at the poles. Um, uh, it was a paradise. We would have loved it, but of course we weren't around. The humans weren't around yet 50 million years ago. So, <clears throat> For the last two and a half million years, we've been living in an ice age uh, in which glacial periods of more than 100,000 years alternate with interglacials of more than 10,000 years. So roughly speaking, the, the glacial period, which is popularly referred to as an ice age, um, is 10 times longer uh, than the interglacials. Uh, we're now living at the end of an interglacial. So at some point in the not too distant future, ice sheets will again cover North America just as they now cover Greenland and Antarctica. Um, so the thickness of the ice over what is now Chicago will be more than a kilometer. Uh, the entire topography of the region will be transformed. The Great Lakes will be remodeled, disappear, there will be Mountains where there are now lakes and lakes where there are now mountains, this will be brought about by the ice. Uh, and it will, this will go on for 100,000 years. Memory of the United States of America, of Russia and China will be lost in the mists of fantastic land. Uh, how soon will this happen? Well, nobody knows for sure. Um, we do know that the beginning of a glacial period is usually more gradual than the termination of a glacial period. So we could reasonably expect as possible that for a few thousand years there will be cooling, there will be alternating cooling and warming, there always is, um, uh, but the cooling will predominate, it will get colder and colder uh, until life around here becomes completely insupportable. If you want to live as a human being, you have to get close to the equator uh, or close to um, <coughs> close to a, a coastal area, which is somewhat warmed by the, uh, by the oceans. Um, and of course, um, the coastal area will be far out from where coastal areas are today, uh, because um, the sea level uh, will drop considerably. So <clears throat> we've seen some very slight warming over the past 300 years, uh, just over one degree uh, over the past 300 years. Um, so, um, this has been beneficial to humans and beneficial to the biosphere generally. It means more living things and more diverse <coughs> living things. Uh, generally speaking, warming is good, cooling is bad. Anything you can do to warm the earth is good. Anything you can do to cool the earth is very, very bad. It's evil and you shouldn't do it. Um, if we were facing global warming, uh, that would be wonderful. But unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that we're facing cooling. Uh, not just uh, in, in a couple of thousand years, but the next 20 years will be years of cooling. The 20s and 30s of the 21st century will show a net cooling. Um, and I'll explain that later. The interglacial that we're in, which is, uh, we can say, last 12,000 years, we're at the end of it last 12,000 years. So the, the <coughs> ice retreated and the new uh, interglacial started 12,000 years ago. So you could say 13,000, depending on exactly how you time it. Uh, but um, I'm going to say 12,000. And we're living in what's called the Holocene interglacial, or the, uh, and within that interglacial, there are fluctuations of warm and cool. So. Um, what we're, what we're now living in, the modern warm period, uh, followed the Little Ice Age, which went from about 1300 to about 1850. The Little Ice Age was the coldest episode in the past 12,000 years. So it's hardly surprising that it's warmed a little bit since then. Um, uh, so it was the, the Little Ice Age was the, the coldest episode in the Holocene interglacial to date. The medieval warm period was warmer than today, 
and that went from about 900 to 1300 CE. Uh, before that, there was the Roman Warm Period. Uh, uh, before that, there was the Dark Ages, which we should call the Cold Ages. Um, uh, there was the Roman Warm Period, uh, and that was um, sort of around 850 to 550 BC. Uh, that was warmer than the medieval warm period. You see, these warm periods keep getting cooler because the Earth is cool. Uh, then, before that, there was the Minoan warm period. That's like three and a half thousand years ago. Um, that was warmer than the Roman warm, warm period. Uh, before that, there was the Holocene maximum. We used to call it the Holocene optimum, which means best. But because of this global warming hysteria, that has become not the correct way to describe it. So we call it the Holocene Maximum. So that was that was it lasted quite a while. It was from 10,000 to 6,000 years ago. Uh, it was much warmer than the Minoan Warm Period. So much much warmer than today. Uh, all these were truly global. What the what the uh, adherents of the pseudoscientific cult of global warming will tell you is that it, these were purely regional, that it was purely in Europe or purely in Greenland that, that uh, we had something like the medieval warm period. That's not true. There's been abundant research in all parts of the world, in Chile, in New Zealand, that showed that these were all global uh, phenomena, global uh, experiences. So, after I've said all that, you have two questions, I'm sure, if you've been paying attention. One is, how do we know about past temperatures? And the second is, why do these changes happen? And remember, I'm just talking now about changes in the past 12,000 years, which is a, a, an instant of time uh, on the, on, in the scale of the history of the Earth. So, there are different ways of estimating past temperatures. One of the uh, most commonly used ways is you get I, you get cores from ice, uh, and, uh, and that will tell you what the uh, global temperature was. And you look at um, isotopes, like for instance the isotopes of uh, oxygen, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Oxygen 16 evaporates more readily than oxygen 18, so it's possible to estimate the temperature at the time when it was snowing that laid down this ice. So that's, how, that's one way. There are other ways using different kinds of isotopes, beryllium-10, and so on. Um, and the different ways of doing it tend to corroborate each other. They tend to cohere into a, a consistent picture. Uh, there are, since we're only talking about the past 12,000 years here, um, there are also much more uh, sort of um, obvious ways of doing this. One is the tree line. Uh, in the, in the north, uh, there is a tree line. Like, trees grow up to a certain point, and they don't go beyond that point. They're always struggling to grow a little bit further north. If the globe warms, the tree line moves north. If the globe cools, the tree line moves south. We know that the tree line in the Holocene Maximum uh, was much higher than it is today, much further north than it is today. Uh, so that shows, that's more corroboration, that it was a lot warmer in Holocene Maximum uh, than it is today. Um, in fact, that would, that, would understate, that would understate the difference, because uh, there has been an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, and one of the things that that does is it stimulates plant growth and it particularly stimulates plant growth where, where conditions are very harsh. Uh, the reason is that more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means fewer stomata on the leaves of plants. Uh, fewer stomata enables uh, the plants to become drought resistant, cold resistant, and in every way more hardy. And so you would expect just the increase in <coughs> carbon dioxide stimulating plant growth, you would expect that to push the tree line further north. And it has, but it hasn't done it enough to wipe out the distinction between the tree line in the, in the Holocene Maximum and the tree line today. Uh, now, of course, it's warming now, so the, so the, um, uh, the tree line is moving gradually north, <coughs> and that's what you expect. 
when it starts cooling, it will start moving south again. This, is, this goes on and on. Uh, it's all happened before, it's all going to happen again. <laughs> to quote the famous uh, TV show, there is nothing man-made or artificial about this. It's just the way uh, nature goes. And it, it doesn't, uh, nature wasn't designed for human benefit. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I mean, another, to give another example of a kind of intuitive uh, corroboration for the way that there have been so many warm periods in the past, the previous interglacial to this one, so we're talking about like 130,000 years ago, uh, is called the Emian, W-E-M-I-A-N, Emian interglacial. Uh, and we know that that, from ice cores and other data, that that was much warmer than today. Um, and in fact, even warmer than the Holocene maximum. It was really warm. Uh, and it was so warm uh, that you would expect to find in northern parts like northern Europe, tropical animals like hippopotamuses and crocodiles. And that's exactly what you find when you, you find the remains of these tropical animals in northern Europe. There were crocodiles at Spitsbergen, which is uh, close to the Arctic Circle. I can't remember now whether it's just above or just below. But anyway, uh, so that's, this is the kind of uh, corroboration that you can get for it. That's quite intuitive and quite convincing. So, um, so I said you had two questions. How do we know what happened? And I've given you some sketch of, of an answer. Uh, and why did it happen? Now that now it becomes much more difficult because there is not much agreement on why all these things happen. Uh, but so, let's divide this question of why it happened into two. First of all, why did an ice age begin, which we're still in, we're still in the ice age. Why did the ice age begin 2.6 million years ago? That's, that's the first question. And then the second question is, what causes these fluctuations between warm and cool periods within the ice age, or between glaciations and interglacials within the ice age? Well, um, universal agreement about why the Ice Age began. This present Ice Age began 2.6 million years ago. Uh, but there is one appealing hypothesis which I will put to you, and that is that it happened because of the, the closing of the Isthmus of Panama. North America and South America used to be separate. There used to be a, a flow between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, it was joined. Actually, if you go back to 50 million years ago. By the way, I make up all these numbers like I make up all these facts, but uh, I am psychic, so you can depend upon them. So 50 million years ago, uh, Australia and Antarctica and South America were all connected. There were land connections between them. And Antarctica was warm. It was verdant. It had a rich uh, animal and plant life. Um, and <coughs> Uh, 50 million years ago, they started to break apart. So that's right at the beginning of the EOC. So you get uh, the, the, the disconnection between Australia and Antarctica and Antarctica and South America. Three million years ago, you get the joining of North America and South America. The disconnection in the South meant that you got the circumpolar current the Antarctic Serpent Pole that comes, goes very rapid current that goes around Antarctica and has a tremendous cooling effect upon the Earth, um, uh, especially on the Southern Hemisphere. And it caused the Antarctic eventually to become icy and uh, eventually further on to become uh, a huge uh, depository for kilometers of ice, a huge ice sheet. Um, <coughs> So, when, so three million years ago, North and South America joined with the Isthmus of Panama. And that's why, I mean, this explains all kinds of things. Uh, one of the things it explains is why we have possums in North America. Possums are related to kangaroos. They're marsupials. So the marsupials went from Australia to Antarctica, which was perfectly equable, not at all frozen, uh, and then to South America. And then much later, uh, they went from South America to North America, that these possums uh, trotted across the Isthmus of Panama and colonized North America. So that's, that's, uh, that's how uh, that explains. There's even a theory 
that the closing of uh, you see the closing of the uh, of the isthmus of Panama meant that it had a generally cooling effect on the North Atlantic, um, and <clears throat> there's even a theory that it that it helped to cause the move from rainforest to savanna in Africa, and that of course helped to give rise to human beings. So we wouldn't be here except that three million years ago the isthmus uh, the isthmus closed. Uh, and there was, no, uh, there was no, no longer any current between the Atlantic and the Pacific except way down uh, the Drake's Passage. So, so I think this is a good explanation of why the Ice Age began 2.6 million years ago. You have to imagine that some of these processes take time to work out. Um, now, why the fluctuations in the ice, it, within the Ice Age? We've had an Ice Age for 2.6 million years. That means we have 100,000 years of glaciation. Most of the Earth is covered in ice. You can only live in a few little spots in the Earth. Uh, and then, every 100,000 years or so, you have an interglacial of 10,000 years or more, where, which is what we're living in, which allows us to live the wonderful life we, we do lead. Um, and that, that goes on, then it stops, and then we go back to glaciation. And as far as we can tell, uh, there's no reason why this won't go on for millions of years to come. Um, so um, so what, what, what accounts for these variations? Well, there is here even less, uh, uh, less of a consensus. There's no agreement whatsoever. Um, uh, but I will mention two th theoretical approaches. Uh, one of them is this. Um, there was a guy called... Milutin Milankovic, who was a Serbian engineer. He put forward his theory in about 1920. He died in 1958. Um, and he, um, he, he assumed that the radiation from the sun was constant. But he noted that things happened to the Earth to change the impact of the radiation, the sun's radiation, on the Earth. So we all know that something like more than 99% of the energy in the, in the Earth's climate system comes from the sun. Right? A little bit comes from down in the center of the Earth, but most of it comes, almost all of it comes from the sun. So, uh, what Milankovic noted was that the way that the solar radiation hits the Earth could vary in three ways, uh, which he called eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. So eccentricity is the fact that the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is elliptical. It's not exactly circular. It's pretty close to circular, but it's actually not exactly circular. And what that means is that sometimes the Sun is further away from the Earth, uh, uh, than it, and sometimes it's closer. So that's, uh, that's eccentricity. Then there is obliquity, which refers to the actual tilt of the, of the, of the Earth in relation to the Sun. Um, and then there is precession which is which hemisphere is pointing to inward towards the sun. I should mention, since it's very elementary, but you might misunderstand unless you don't get it, um, that the impact of solar radiation on the northern hemisphere is more dramatic than on the southern hemisphere because there's twice as much land in the northern hemisphere as in the southern hemisphere. And that, that causes the impact, the temperature impact, to be much greater. So, um, so, so uh, Milankovic uh, devised a theory based on the interaction of these th three things, eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. Um, and they put these together and he arrived at a theory uh, which said that crucial stages in the development of glaciation uh, had a lot to do with the incidence of solar radiation uh, at 65 degrees north. Um, and when that, when that occurred, you tended to get the end of the, the glaciation. So, that, so today there are believers in the whole Milankovitch theory. And there are other people who don't accept the whole Milankovitch theory, but they, do it, they try to come up with a new theory based on elements of it. So, that's one, so this is one theoretical approach to explaining um, the cyclical nature of, um, of the warm and cold periods that we have within the Ice Age. Um, then there's a different theory, which I'm quite fond of, 
you might say I'm been warming towards it. Um, and that is, um, somebody's awake. <laughs> That's always a good sign. <laughs> uh, and that is Svensmark's theory. Uh, Svensmark um, uh, looks at variations in the sun's output. Now, when most climate scientists look at the sun, one of the things they notice is there is something called TSI, total solar irradiance. I don't know why they say irradiance, but uh, instead of just radiance, but irregardless of that, um, that's what they do. So it's called TSI, total solar irradiance. Uh, and they, it's been noted, ever since they measured it accurately, it's been noticed that the difference in total solar irradiance is very small. And that led to people who had been speculating about the sun's influence on climate, uh, dismissing it. It's like it often happens in, 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 in the field of thought that people are bowled over by some new discovery. And they were bowled over by the discovery that the variation in TSI is very small. Um, uh, although there are things which go against that, for example, the variation in ultraviolet uh, is quite big, and that might have some sort of impact. But anyway, that's not Svensmark's theory. Um, five minutes? I'm talking about thousands of years and millions of years here, and you're constricting me to five minutes. Oh. Well, there are 30 yeah, minutes is, each side, um, so... So, so um, I wouldn't have complained if he'd come on. But anyway, well. so... Um, Okay, Svensmark's theory, in a nutshell, is that um, when the sun is more active, it sidelines, so to speak, more cosmic rays. So the Earth is constantly being bombarded by cosmic rays. These come from ex massive exploding stars, millions of light years away, typically 10 million light years away. So. Uh, and you might say, oh, an exploding star is a very rare event, but there's so many stars that it's continuous, continuous bombardment. Uh, and so these cosmic rays are coming there, and they hit the Earth's atmosphere, they break up, but they then go through the Earth. They, they're the chief cause of ionization in the atmosphere. They create things like carbon-14, and other isotopes by their ionizing effects. Um, and Svensmark theory is, is that, um, when the sun is active, the solar wind, which we only discovered uh, you know, like 50 years ago or something, um, the solar wind uh, and the other activity, the magnetic activity of the sun and so on, deflects uh, a lot of these cosmic rays. So it reduces the cosmic rays flux on the atmosphere. And there is, um, his argument is that when the cosmic rays create clouds, they help to create clouds. This might strike you as strange. I have to explain to you that if you had a completely free, uh, clean air with no particles in it whatsoever, uh, you would never have clouds no matter how much water vapor you have. Clouds don't form unless there are little particles. Uh, and these are called cloud con condensation nuclei. Uh, and unless you have those, you don't have clouds. Uh, and the more of them you have, the more clouds you have, because that is effectively the limit in many circumstances on the, on the amount of clouds and also, very importantly, on the whiteness of the clouds. Uh, because if the clouds are white, uh, what happens is that they form part of the albedo, uh, in fact the great majority of the albedo, uh, and they reflect solar radiation back into space. Uh, so Svensmark's theory is that when the sun's active, um, it uh, warms the Earth, and it does that by uh, reducing the incidence of cosmic rays, so fewer cloud condensation nuclei are produced, and so there are fewer white clouds, or maybe less white cloud, less, clouds that are less white. So that's his theory. Uh, it's been developed uh, very, in very interesting directions by Nir Shaviv, who is a, um, a climate scientist, uh, an astrophysicist, who has developed this theory. So, um, so those are two ways of looking at the, at the, at the variations uh, we've had throughout the Holocene. Now, I, I mentioned that uh, we, we're going to see global cooling for the next 20 years. The, in 20 years from now, the, t the temperature of the Earth is going to be lower than it is today. Why do I say that? Well, partly because the sun is going into a, has gone into a quieter phase. 
uh, but also certain cyclical processes that go on in ocean currents and so on uh, are not going to counteract that. The most important is the what's called the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. Uh, that has moved from a warming to a cooling uh, phase. So that's 70 years of warming, there is now going to be 70 years of cooling. So it's not going to counteract uh, the reduced activity of the sun. Um, so the, the global cooling that occurs for the next 20 years, um, to judge by past behavior, people will suddenly start saying, oh, the great threat is global cooling. And they're ready for this already because they've changed the term global warming into climate change. So whatever, it ha whatever the climate does, they can say um, it's due to, we need, the, we need a socialist government to take care of it, essentially. Uh, we need totalitarianism. It's the only possible way to solve this problem. Uh, because the conclusion is for preordained. Uh, then you, you assemble the evidence from, where, where, from wherever you, you can find it. Um, so uh, this cooling that will go on for 20 years, uh, and it won't be regular every year because there are all kinds of things that disturb this, the best known being the, uh, the El Nino, uh, Southern Oscillation, that causes spikes in temperature uh, randomly, so to speak, chaotically, and then it's followed by cool, a cooler period. Um, but so it won't be uniform. But 20 years from now, the temperature of the Earth will be cooler than it is today. And the, uh, the, the socialists and others, greenists and other people who believe in this global warming stuff will be tearing their hair out. And they'll say, no, 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 we got it wrong. It's global cooling. Um, so uh, uh, that, that period of cooling is not necessarily the commencement of the new glaciation. In other words, there may well be further warming after that. That's quite possible. Um, now, Somebody may refuse to accept what I'm saying. And somebody may say that something like this. It's been warming for 300 years. Uh, uh, obviously, it's going to go on forever. Um, and therefore, we, the, the global warming is a big problem. And what I would say to such a person is this. If you happen to notice that there are a couple of consecutive days in October, <laughs> where the temperature is slightly above average, uh, would, you, would it be reasonable to say there isn't going to be a winter this year? That's it, winter's abolished, it's getting warmer. No, no, no. Uh, well, a couple of days is like a couple of centuries when we're looking at the timescales we're looking at here. So we've had this, this very, very slight warming uh, for 300 years, uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to go on forever. It has very little to do with carbon dioxide, but I will explain if anybody asks me about that. Um, and winter is coming. It's happened before. It will happen again. Winter is coming. All right. Thank you. Time for questions. Time for questions. Our moderator will be picking. Both of you get up there. Let's. Uh, Let's get right to it. Um, you go ahead and pick out. So who all has questions? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. <clears throat> He's going to take, we'll get it. You're going to get a second round of the cat. Okay. 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 All right. Two at that table. One at that table. Okay. I don't see anybody else. All right. All right, so I'll go with this one first. Oh, thank you. I have a question for your timelines and so forth. They seem to be quite accurate. Can't hear you. Can't hear oh, I'm you. sorry. I'm just saying your timelines and what you described seems to me to be fairly accurate, except when you talk about how warm it was or how cold it was, there weren't any humans. <coughs> We're only talking about humans' activity on this earth. Everything you describe is the earth's activity, which is true. I doubt seriously if the humans are going to make it past your 20, 30 years. If your 20 is 100, which it could easily be, there won't be anybody here. And not at 7.5 billion going to 10 billion. We're going to feed ourselves. As this what? gets hotter, just in this little interim you're talking about, it's What's your question? That, that you're wrong. <laughs> oh, well, I, about uh, humans. Yeah. Um, okay, well, the, the quick answer is I'm not wrong. Um, uh, everything I say is true. I see. Um, uh, but um, uh, the rate of warming we've been experiencing in the last 20 or 30 years is very, very tiny. It's, it's actually, uh, 
it's hardly within the bounds of, of our measurements. I, mean, I do accept that it's been going on, but it's very, very tiny. We're talking about uh, tenths of a degree. Um, so um, that's all we're talking about. It's not going to kill humans off in the next 20 years, I can assure you of that. And we might freeze to death, but we're certainly Sorry. not going to fry to death. You may be. Um, so um, so that, that, uh, that's basically uh, the answer to your question. Okay. I'm talking about food growing, that sort of thing. Okay, the other thing is this. I mean, um, I hate to appeal to a scientific consensus because I'm not intimidated by consensuses. Uh, but the, consens the very powerful consensus among demographers is that in a few decades, the, ten the population, the human population of the Earth is going to start to fall. Yep. It's already falling in the, in the industrialized uh, places like Europe and North America and Japan. Um, uh, uh, it's not falling yet in uh, places like Africa. But uh, assuming that there is continued economic growth, uh, uh, economic growth drives uh, the decline in, uh, decline in population. In fact, I mean, it's already true that in, in North America and Europe and Japan, well, Japan is a shrinking population. North America and Europe uh, would be shrinking populations except for immigration. So, uh, so it is possible that um, if the demography, if nothing happens to inter interrupt economic growth, that the population of the Earth will start to decline in a few decades. Okay, next question. Can I comment on that? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I agree completely with uh, what the questioner asked, or, or the comment he made. Uh, Mr. Steele um, talked completely about uh, natural uh, cycles, um, which isn't, isn't news to, to climatologists. Okay? He, everything he said uh, pretty much is known by climatologists. Um, but uh, the gentleman here pointed out that um, he's ignoring completely uh, the human activity that's happened over the past uh, century or so. And you can talk all, all day and all night and all year and for decades about uh, uh, natural climate cycles. Uh, the point is that humans arrived, um, a few, uh, human uh, industry arrived 150 years ago and completely threw that out, out of whack. Yep. Okay. Yep. Next question. The, the, uh, the Green New, Green New Deal people say it's the end, it'll be the end of the world in 10 years because of greenhouse emissions. What do you think about that? Yeah. End of the world. It's amazingly silly. silly. Huh? I think it's amazingly silly. silly. Yeah. Um, they, don't, they don't understand. Um, uh, Use the mic, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what matters to the climate is not the amount of, it, of emissions, it's the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's gone in, in the past few decades from um, uh, 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million. 400 parts per million is 0.04% of the atmosphere. That's what it is now, just a little. It's going up. Uh, it will probably reach 0.05% of the atmosphere. Um, that's not going to kill anyone. <laughs> I mean, that is, that is much lower than it, than it has been in the history of the Earth. Um, it's lower than it is in this room right now. Um, uh, it's lower than it is in a forest canopy. Uh, this, this is not a threat to anybody, and it actually stimulates plant growth. And one of the reasons why we've had such success in feeding people in recent years is because there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Not because of warming, but because more carbon dioxide stimulates plant growth, as any person with a greenhouse is well aware. Okay, any, any comments? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, a little uh, higher, in fact, even a lot higher carbon dioxide isn't going to kill anybody in this room, but it's going to change the composition of the atmosphere incrementally. And that, that slight change over the entire Earth and over time causes this slight warming, which has feedback effects, okay? So, uh, yeah, the, the, there's a, carbon dioxide is a trace gas, but that trace is significant in affecting our climate. And the higher that, that trace, okay, um, the more it's gonna have a large effect. Um, so this is a, a straw man, that uh, argument. It's not gonna kill anybody, so what? That's irrelevant. Okay, next questioner, please. Yes, sir. Uh, all of which, to a lot of us, I think, boils down to how is this in 25 to 50 years or 100 years going to impact uh, our civilizations as we know them today? Who are going to be the big players uh, in the what they used to call the great game? 
uh, <coughs> what you know, get, getting getting uh, down to what I think really concerns a lot of people is uh, how is this going to change the lives uh, of our grandchildren and great grandchildren uh, going down. Well, as long as the cooling is not too great, there's no reason it should change it dramatically. If the cooling, if, if you had an event where, for example, uh, the earth cooled by two degrees suddenly within a few years, uh, that would lead to famine because the, the, earth, the world feeding the world's population is now based on grain growth, monoculture, grain mon monoculture. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, a sudden drop in temperature would mean famine. Uh, warming isn't a threat to anybody. Um, it just improves everybody's lives. Uh, and um, so that's, so basically, you have, we don't know with enough precision how soon the next glaciation is going to really start. So we might have another thousand years before it really becomes terrible. We might. Uh, we don't know. Um, so um, it, as long as the glaciation doesn't get underway, um, uh, then uh, people's lives are not going to be tremendously uh, harmed, especially in advanced industrial countries like the United States. Um, well, if you live in Florida or any coastal city, you might differ on that opinion there. Um, with uh, the ice sheet of Greenland and um, uh, melting and uh, Antarctica starting to melt and all those glaciers, uh, the sea levels are going to rise by many feet, 10, 20 feet, or whatever it is, okay? It's going to flood um, a whole lot of coastal cities, uh, make them completely unlivable, as well as a lot of islands, okay? Um, also, plants and animals, um, we have to consider that plants and animals aren't as adaptive as human beings. So they, uh, that's one of the reasons that, that they're becoming, uh, that we have this mass extinction going on right now as we speak. There are very many factors, but uh, one of them is that their failure to adapt to this very sudden, geologically speaking, uh, very sudden rise in temperature. Um, they can't uh, get up and move, uh, many of them, as easily as human beings, um, and they're failing. Uh, that's one of the reasons for the mass extinctions, and that's gonna affect us uh, as well, because we depend uh, on a lot of plants and animals, obviously. <coughs> Charlie. Yeah, David, I found your chronology of Earth periods very interesting. Uh, however, of the half dozen periods you cited, there's one thing that is unique to the modern period, and is that human activity is resulting in the United States alone in a production of 60 billion tons, billion, with it be tons annually of CO2. Not doubting the European Union, Asia, and other parts of the world. So you're saying all, you're equating all of them are the same. So how do you count if this might have some effect? Well, everything has some effect. Um, and it's just minute, what you uh, didn't I mean, discuss it at all. What you have to understand is that you could take humans out of the picture. Right? Imagine humans suddenly went extinct and all human activity stopped. There would still be a carbon cycle. There would still be billions of, of tons of carbon dioxide produced by other living things, plants and animals, every day. Uh, and uh, the, the, um, the, even today, the emission, if you call these emissions, if you like, call natural production of carbon dioxide emissions, then um, more than 95% of emissions today are purely natural. Uh, what happens to that carbon dioxide? Well, a lot of it goes to, as food for plants, so they can use photosynthesis. Uh, they use carbon dioxide um, and they produce oxygen. And so the animals can breathe because they breathe the oxygen produced by, by the plants. So, the, so the, all these billions that seem so big to you is a tiny fraction of this natural cycle of carbon. Uh, it, so, uh, you know, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to speculate that maybe something disastrous is going to happen because there's been this tiny increase in the amount of carbon dioxide produced. Uh, but that's all it is, it's a speculation. What you have to do is make empirical studies and find out what's actually happening. Well, what's actually happening is 
that the, uh, in the past 200 years, the temperature of the Earth, as far as we can determine it, has gone up by one degree Celsius. In other words, it's nowhere near as hot as it was for most of the, the, the last 12,000 years. Follow most question. of the last 12,000 years were a lot hotter than it is today. Are you totally today. ignorant? Uh, the damaging effects increased temperature has had upon the crops of the world? And you're saying CO2 gases are beneficial and facilitate food? Why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't they be? Why would, you don't, they're you, like health you, plants, right? You don't grow crops in Greenland, although they used to when the, in the medieval warm period, actually, but you don't anymore. You grow crops in where it's warm and wet. Um, yeah, that's, that's misinformation about uh, CO2 emissions. Um, humans aren't causing a huge amount, okay, compared to the natural world. The natural, uh, the, the CO2 emissions nowadays um, are largely human. The added human, the added CO2 emissions. Um, you, have to, you have to use some common sense too. Uh, natural emissions are constant, okay. Uh, volcanoes, uh, what animals produce, okay, those, that's been constant for the past many millions of years. This, the, uh, Mr. Steele is not taking into account that humans arrived and started doing some, something very dramatic, namely producing goo gobs, goo gobs, okay, uh, like I said, gigatons. Is, is that a minor thing, a gigaton, okay, of carbon dioxide, and that's additional. Uh, in addition to the natural production, and that's having a large effect. And it's, it's totally irrational to expect uh, that to not have an effect. Well, of course it has some effect, but that doesn't mean it has a disastrous effect. Um, the, the, the carbon dioxide that is produced, the carbon dioxide that is produced is used, it's used by plants. So what happens is if you get more carbon dioxide, you get more use of carbon dioxide. So there is an equilibrium reach. Like and uh, don't forget that for, um, uh, for millions of years, the, am the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was way higher than it is today. Today it's 400 parts per million. There were times when it was 4,000 parts per million, right? Now that was before humans, but there were, um, you know, there were primates, there were, there, there were uh, ancestors of humans. So um, it, it's not automatically off. It's, it, it's, just because there's been a, a, an increase in carbon dioxide, it's, it doesn't automatically follow uh, that that's disastrous. Right, the, the, the problem, just one more comment on that. The problem is the suddenness, okay? I showed you that graph where uh, natural changes in temperature, I could have shown, shown you uh, carbon dioxide changes as well, uh, happen over uh, thousands and millions of years. This uh, uh, human-caused change is a s very sudden spike, okay? Um, it's like an explosion, geologically speaking, and that's causing a lot of problems. Um, so it's the speed. It's not so much, it's practically irrelevant that in the past there used to be higher carbon dioxide. The problem is now the, the way, uh, the speed that is rising, it, uh, plants and animals and in fact humans to a large degree uh, are having trouble adapting to it. If we had millions of years, if, if the animal uh, world had millions of years to adapt to rising carbon dioxide, they would do so. Okay. Uh, gentleman in the blackjack. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what are you going to do about it? Me or him? Both. Both. What do you mean? Well, what, more specifically, what do you mean? What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Well, how do we fix the problem? Well, well, the problem is cooling. The problem is gla the coming glaciation. I, I'm not sure there's much can be done about that. Uh, I think it's, it's just, it, it's going to go on, uh, and as I say, um, the United States of America, uh, Russia, and China will be lost, except in the mists of fantastic legend. Uh, and um, it, you, it, I would say get close to the equator if you want to survive, would be my, my advice to my great-great-grandchildren. Um, but um, uh, nothing, I, 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 one idea, you know, when I, when I found out about the isthmus being so decisive in, uh, in cooling the Northern Hemisphere, it occurred, to, you know, years ago before I knew about this, I'd heard about the pr proposal to dig a deeper Panama Canal that wouldn't depend on locks, but would actually unite the, the waters of the Atlantic and the Pacific. So it would go back to being like it was three million years ago. And at the time I thought, well, that's terrible because there'd be all these species of fish would go extinct because they've evolved in three million years to have different kinds of fish. 
uh, in many cases, and they'd meet up and, uh, and it would be, you know, falling carnage. I'd rather keep the diversity. But now I think it might be a good idea because it might warm the northern hemisphere up, get rid of all this ice and snow that we don't need, and it's just a pain in the neck. Uh, and it'd um, be very good for human beings. But of course there are many other variables that affect it, so that probably wouldn't be enough. Uh, and big geoengineering uh, projects like that, I would never trust to government, uh, because the government screws up everything. Um, well, the, uh, the answer is obvious, and it's been said many, many times, uh, cut down on carbon dioxide emissions, okay? Uh, that really has to be done. They, they keep the oil in the ground. Keep the uh, natural gas in the ground. Uh, we can't continue on this uh, carbon burning, in, in this carbon burning vein that we've been on for the past uh, many decades. Um, so that's, that's one of the main things that we have to do about that. I, I would make just one brief comment on that. If you think that increasing carbon dioxide is a problem and you want to do something about it, you logically should become an ardent supporter of nuclear power. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the only alternative to fossil fuels. There is no other alternative. All right, Andy? Yes, uh, I have a question. How fast do you think the, the cooling is going to uh, ice over North America after the sea level rises 60 feet in this century? The sea level will, will not rise 60 feet, well, at least not, not until after the next glaciation. Maybe 120,000 years from now it will rise 60 feet. But it, well, it, you, you're, neither you nor any of your descendants are going to see the sea level rise 60 feet. That's just nonsense. One sec. Uh, that's, that, that's documented science right now. Documented hogwash. Uh, documented all over the world. And the fact that, the fact that you say it's not happening, doesn't mean that it's not a fact. Well, no, there is sea level rise, but it's like a centimeter or a decade or something like that. That's picking up speed after the Well, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go the other direction when it starts to cool. Okay. Um, well, David has some weird science. I don't know where he gets it from. Yeah, sure. Sea levels have been rising, and they're rising constantly, and there's no reason to think they're not going to keep on rising as the ice melts. You have glaciers melting, you have ice caps melting, the uh, water uh, is rising in the sea for that reason, and also for the ex because of expansion. Water expands when it warms, and the seas are, uh, the oceans are warming as well. So there's no, we don't see any, scientifically, we don't see any uh, uh, going back, okay? The, the rise uh, of sea levels is going to continue, and there's no reason to think otherwise. I don't know what kind of science he's, he's coming from. Yeah. Sure. John. Okay. If there was a second Earth, that this eco side that 97 percent of the scientific community on Earth agrees uh, is causing the destruction to air, land, and water, uh, would either of you move to that planet or stay on this planet? I'm not sure I understand the question. If you had a choice to go to another Earth or stay on this Earth as it currently stands. Which would I mean, if it was a warmer Earth, I'd go there. Fair enough. Uh, uh, could I ask well, um, I don't like hypotheticals, but um, this this is my home. This is the home of every one of you. Nobody's going anywhere. Okay. Even if there was another Earth, you can't travel to it because there's radiation in space that kills everybody. That's why they didn't go to this. The main reason they didn't go to any goddamn moon to begin with. So this is one, uh, one Earth, and you can't take it. You can't be playing games with this Earth. Uh, all right. Uh, gentleman in the blue plaid. Uh, right now, there's some things that are happening which we really can't argue about. Lake Michigan, in the last six years, is up six feet. Yeah. And uh, it's been there before. frequently we hear it setting new records. What's going to happen when Lake Michigan is up a total of 12 feet yeah. in the next six years? Yeah. Wow. This, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're sitting here today, yeah. at one time was under 60 feet of water. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, about 10 years ago, they were saying that global warming was responsible for the fall in Lake Michigan. Remember that? Um, oh, yeah. Because it was evaporating the water. Now they're saying that uh, it's responsible for the rise. Uh, it goes up and down for reasons unconnected with the temperature. Rogers Park beaches are washed out, South Shore is flooding into the buildings, Lakeshore Drive is frequently closed because of the flooding. What's going to happen in the next 
Lake, lake levels have a lot to do with, precipitate, with precipitation, and it's not a simple connection with global warming. Global warming uh, explains more the rise in sea levels which flood uh, um, oceanside um, areas and cities. Um, you know, localities like uh, Lake Michigan in the middle of continents, that would not uh, be, uh, there would not be a direct correlation as simple as rising sea levels flooding. Um, I'm not talking about global warming, I'm just looking at what is happening and projecting what is happening into the future. But it won't happen, it won't, you can't project it. Okay. Oh, why not? All right, next question. Um, because you did make a few political comments like Can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. Uh, because you did make some political comments like equating socialism with totalitarianism, just as in passing, um, I'm wondering, um, if, you know, I heard you talk the last time, and I'm looking at, well, I just have to say one more thing that is that I think is kind of crazy, and that is the idea that um, warming doesn't lead to famine when we're watching people's uh, crops dry out or get yeah. flooded and people are quickly leaving where they grew things to eat because they can't grow things to eat anymore because there's not enough rain. Um, so basically what I want to know is what do you think about the present situation of human beings that are suffering that are being forced to leave their lands and countries um, because of changes in the, in the weather. And um, I also take issue with the idea that the government screws up everything. I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm asking too many questions, but my first question is about what, you, what would you do about the present situation and the suffering of the human beings on this earth? and the animals too. And my second comment is, um, what is more screwed up than the, uh, than the uh, health insurance? What is more screwed up than uh, uh, the um, uh, international corporations taking all the money and leaving everybody else with nothing? Uh, that doesn't have to do with the global warming, but it, it's, you said the government screws up everything. Okay. And I, you know, Private, private, private enterprise screws up a lot of stuff. But what I really, my question is, what is your opinion to the, of how we would deal with the present situation and what is happening to human beings right. on the earth? Excellent question. Well, I would donate to a charity which looked after people who were, uh, because of floods or other local things were, uh, were inconvenienced. Certainly, I've got a good answer. But I mean, uh, if you look at the, the whole scale of food output in the world, it's growing all the time. Poverty keeps declining. Um, it, you know, um, there, there is there, there isn't um, there isn't a growth of ecological disaster throughout the world. On the contrary, things are getting better and better for most people. Uh, again, a lot of people would beg to differ that things are getting better. From, um, what we need to do, as I've said many times before, about suffering of people in many places for a variety of reasons, okay, including in this country, is to have uh, actual democracy where real people um, analyze their situation and take uh, decisive measures and not leave it up to uh, the plutocrats and the minions in the Congress and pre presidents, etc., politicians. That's what or the insurance companies, that's right. We need control. Ordinary humans that are concerned about the suffering of their fellow humans need to be able to control their society and the entire world for that matter. And that's what we need, democracy. Real, real democratic government. Okay. Okay. Right here. Uh, yeah, my question is directed more at uh, Ted Aranda. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to see planes go over that would leave a long line in the sky and we called them sky riders, sky riders. And when you talk, when you showed us those pictures of planes, is that what those are in effect, sky riders? I suppose That's it, part of my question. Okay. All right, I'm going to answer that right away if you want to. Go ahead. 
Uh, in effect, that's what they are, except that now, it, instead of individual sky writers, every now and then writing something in the sky, just the other day I saw somebody making a figure in the sky. Okay, th th those are aerosols. Those are uh, particulates, maybe nanoparticulates. Uh, the problem, the, the, the situation now, though, is that um, we have an entire program, a gov apparently a government program, that has to be something like a government program, of doing this on a massive scale, an unbelievably massive scale, practically every day. Okay, that, so they're depositing aerosols, but on a massive scale compared to what you, you're talking about. Uh, then in that case, then, do you think that uh, we should call in Roy Rogers and Day Elevens to sing uh, Happy Kim Trails to you? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah. I thought there was a question at this yeah. table. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, my question was mainly, uh, but you could both address it, but as I was listening to Ted, I was thinking, you know, who, why, uh, chemtrails, you know, and um, you just kind of addressed it with, with the massive government program. So, um, and I saw you had, then I thought, H-A-A-R-P, uh, is, what is that? You had it in your thing. And I look it up and found a great site, wanttoknow.info. There's a lot of documentaries about this government program. They used to be called a conspiracy theory, but in fact, they're doing, they're using warfare. Um, I mean, that's why, I mean, the only, ex my biggest question is why, who is paying you to do this disinformation? And I think it is like a security government cover-up because, I mean, uh, that's the overall pattern is, they say they can disrupt, you know, communications of an enemy, you know, um, they can, they can, and you heard Trump say, why don't you bomb the hurricane? But apparently they can, this is the kind of crazy thinking of creating hurricanes and tsunamis. All right, well, this we, is, we gotta, uh, we so I'm, I, could question. you address it? Are you being paid by any way by a fascist totalitarian <laughs> government, the CIA, uh, to, to, to cover <laughs> up uh, the truth? Because without the truth and no, action of the I, top, I, I, we're good. And I'd like to, so it's got to start with the working? class. Question. Question. Yeah. Who are you working for? Who are you working for? Who are you Who's working paying for? You? Nobody's paying me anything. No money comes from a fascist. I know your father was I mean, fascist, right? I, I'd uh, love it. If anybody's listening or watching, uh, send me money, please. There's no mystery to fascism. It is okay, a that's, plan that's, that's, and all right. strategy all for right. war. This, that's all right. Right. Okay. this lady yeah, here, me, this lady me, here had a let question. Me address, let me address the first part of the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're exactly right. The harp is not a conspiracy theory. That's a facility in Alaska. Uh, that shoots radio waves into the atmosphere where these particulates are. The whole point, uh, militarily, of putting aerosols in the atmosphere is that then, then, then you can uh, manipulate the atmosphere. If it was clear, there would be nothing for the uh, energy waves to, to hit and to bounce around and to cause to expand or, and move around or whatever. So yeah, HARP is very real. It's a large facility in Alaska, and there are others like it. Um, some people uh, claim that there are like 30 facilities around the world similar to HARP. Um, so yeah, that's not a conspiracy theory. They are, they are definitely manipulating uh, the atmosphere and therefore the weather. I think you went around already with other questions. I, yeah, I went around with And then this lady here has one she would like to I, ask. Okay, yeah, yeah. I have a question for both of them. We all know the only thing that's constant is change. Okay? And listening to the two of you, you have individually decided what factors of change you will acknowledge and how much weight you want to give these factors. But at the same time, all of us in here will not live in the future that you're talking about. We can say it's happening now, but we can say that in what proportion. So from a stoic point of view, could the two of you combine your two theories for us, or knowledges for us, and project it? Yes. Uh, as I understand it, our theories contradict each other. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't see how you can combine them. You, you have to. Um, you might be able to combine bits of one with bits of the other. There is such a thing as reality. And cause yes, and my theory is That's a correct the description of reality. This theory is an incorrect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's that simple. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, let, me, uh, try, let me answer 
one of the, one of the uh. things that you said there. Um, we, we do agree, actually, on a lot of uh, the natural cycles. Every, most of what he said about the past, I've been, stu I've been reading on these things. Uh, okay, but a lot of it is irrelevant, it's frankly irrelevant, because what we're talking about is, uh, with global warming today, is human caused global warming. So, uh, so you have two sides, okay, you have humans caused global warming and past global warming from natural causes. I acknowledge both of those. He acknowledges only the natural uh, global, uh, um, global warming, I assume, right? Is that, am I correct? No, but well, that's not quite correct. I mean, I do accept that there is a greenhouse effect, and I do accept that carbon dioxide is greenhouse gas. The question is, how sensitive is the atmosphere to increases in carbon dioxide? I think it's very insensitive. Uh, I think that um, uh, a doubling of carbon dioxide would probably give you less than one degree Celsius increase, whereas the IPCC puts it at somewhere between 3 and 7 percent. I think that's absolute nonsense. Oh, or to put it more politely, it's just wrong. It's false. It's incorrect. Yeah, I don't think we have time for another round. Yeah. All right. So quick thing, we're, we're, we're going to skip the second round of questions because think of it as we have two speakers, so one round, two oh, rounds. Right. We just don't have enough time to do that and then like a nice full round of rebuttal. So let's just go straight. Probably eight o'clock, so we'll go straight. I'm not even going to ask a question. I've got five. So let's just go oh, okay. to like a, who wants to do rebuttal? Okay. Five Okay, how many? Are you going to do it? Can you just say it? How many? Uh, okay, so keep your, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you want to do rebuttal. Keep your hands up if you want to do rebuttal. Okay. How many altogether? <laughs> All right, so how many? How much time do we have for a uh, Probably 30 to 35 minutes. How many are co speak wanting to speak? Uh, let's see. I've got 11. We'll probably go about three minutes apiece. Um, that way we could still accommodate some sla last minute slackers. Um, Andy, can you keep time, please, for three minutes? And uh, let's get our first rebutter up there and. Let's thank our speakers. Let's thank our speakers and uh, get our first rebutter up here. Uh, I got an opportunity to speak to the um, Greenhouse Gas Act and the 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 Greenhouse Gas Act uh, how climate disruptions affect our nuclear power plants threatens the future of Chicagoans. I'm Jan Budar of the Nuclear Energy Information Service. We have, oh, sorry. Oh my goodness. Wait, stop the clock. Uh, we have been we have been updating and briefing the people of Chicago since 1981 on the risk connected with the nuclear power plants that now surround Lake Michigan and other Great Lakes. These nuclear power plants are also found near the rivers and lakes of central and northern Illinois. Illinois is the most nuclear state in the union and also harbors more high-level waste, radioactive waste, than any other state. Chicago is surrounded by six of these risky pro by eight of these risky projects within 70 miles, and three others that are downwind. Please refer to the map. Oh, anyway, you've seen this map. 
Climate destruction can have a profound effect on the safety of our nuclear power plants in significant ways, with heating, flooding, and drought being the most significant. Climate disruption can affect Lake Michigan, as has been identified by Mayor Lightfoot and Governor Pritzker, having just this past week declared a state of emergency regarding the Lake Michigan shoreline in Chicago. There are six nuclear power plants, both working and dismantled, on the shores of Lake Michigan. Recent high water is a threat to already precarious safety of these installations. Powering videos this winter from a police helicopter show water lapping very near the Palisades and Cook plants on the other side of the lake from Chicago in western Michigan. In Zion, in Zion Illinois, there are many tons of high-level radioactive waste stored on the shoreline of Lake Michigan, 40 miles from the center of Chicago. Each of the 64 casks that hold spent fuel contains as much cesium-137 as was released during the Chernobyl accident. Cesium-137 insinuates into organs in the body. It has a half-life of 30 years, and as it goes through radioactive decay, it disrupts organ systems in humans, animals, and even plants. Union of Concerned Scientists said in a July 1st USA Today article, that's this uh, 2019, uh, for every 10 degrees that the temperature goes up, the lifetime of the electrical equipment is reduced quite a bit. Some of your... Yep, you're out of time. Yeah, but I didn't get started because of the paint falling off and whatever. Finish, an answer for, uh, all right, 30 go, seconds. Go ahead, go finish. Our director, David Kraft, in an article from Inside Climate News, cited a litany of examples where low water or warm water caused millions of dollars damage to nuclear plants forced to shut down or upgrade their safety equipment due to higher than normal temperatures. In 1988 and 2006, excessive heat or drought caused multiple nuclear power plants in Illinois to cut back production because the water was too hot or in low supply to, use, uh, to cool the nuclear fuel during operation. The high level risk from aging nuclear power plants and the thousands of tons of radioactive a high level radioactive waste that surround this city show that it is right and needed for the Chicago City Council to declare a climate emergency. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, next. Next. Hard to believe that three minutes turns into five, but uh, well, uh, last week, uh, there were speakers who were talking about how great socialism is. I don't agree with that. Democratic socialism has failed in Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, or Ecuador, El Salvador, Chile, Nicaragua, Uruguay, Cuba. It's not the greatest now. It's, it, it's not that good. In Venezuela, the inflation rate reached one million percent. George McGovern ran for president in 1972 under a platform similar to the Democrats' uh, current uh, uh, agenda. He lost 49 states. The Green New Deal plan is to have 100% renewable energy within the next 10 years. The Green New Deal, wind and solar energy, would cost the U.S. $2 trillion. Capitalist Korea and West Germany has done much better than socialist North Korea and East Germany. The, uh, <clears throat> in the 20th century, over 100 million people were murdered under the socialist countries of Russia, China, Nazi Germany, and Russia. Germany was not a socialist What? Uh, under the capitalist Trump administration, the economy, the economy is booming, employment is up for blacks and Latinos and women, and the stock market is up 40%. Germany too. Hey, quiet. <laughs> None of the current Democratic presidential candidates will beat Trump with the exception of possibly Michael Bloomberg. A Democratic ticket of Bloomberg and Hillary would win, I think. I saw it in the internet today. He's going to run with, with Hillary. Okay. All right, next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.
Yeah. All right, Jonathan, three minutes. Thank you to these two titans of global warmingness, Ted and David. We're at the 23rd hour, 59th minute. Uh, so here goes. We rent the room within the chain, yet the hours that heal our hearts usually. And in the minutes we can't feel, these seconds of strength live inside what you remember. It's a view of beautiful rain, yet the hours that heal our souls usually. And in the seconds we can't touch, these moments of searching are inside what you revisit. It's a tune of bittersweet days, yet the hours that heal our minds usually. And in the unnamed we can't grasp, these seasons of warmth shine inside what you recover. A real kind of flag, just look to the sky, she will say it. The sun is a mass, so much more than all these failures. There's a patch of grass in the most unlikeliest of places. Each time we ask, answers reply. They are strange ones, but they're graceful. Despot oust underway, and all the ranks are green eyes. For once, let's call the play. We're called the mind's eye when the knee retires. Our vision can hold the weight a long term. Just keep up our fight. The unknown is only unnamed. We are inside, dreamlike. Uh, we need a World War II mass mobilization, Green New Deal, to live in balance with planet Earth, uh, because this is the only home we have. And uh, like the speakers uh, said, uh, we are carbon-based life form earthlings. So one of my favorite carbon-based life form earthling is by the name of Bertrand Russell. He said this once. Human beings are credulous animals and must believe something. In the absence of good grounds for belief, we will be satisfied with bad ones. Uh, I think when I think about who we need to remember in our past who faced tremendous odds in order to make this planet more livable for all, uh, we all, of course, go to arguably the greatest American ever, uh, King. So here's a quote by King that is very important to uh, inspire us all in our communities to uh, participate in the Green New Deal mass mobilization. Let's all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood and sisterhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace, brotherhood, and sisterhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, let's not let his loss be in vain. Please remember, uh, we have one Earth, and we need to have each other, no matter how much we disagree, in order to live in balance with it. Wonderful job. All right. Okay, thanks for your presentations. My name is Dennis Nelson. Ever since the Bush Cheney years, the Pentagon as a conservative institution has been taking the national, regional, and global security threats from anthropogenic climate disruption very seriously. Those are thoroughly documented in all hell breaking loose, the Pentagon's perspective on climate change, a recent dynamite book by security specialist Michael T. Clare. This is according to the National Intelligence Council's 2015 report entitled Global Food Security. Quote, we judge that the overall risk of food insecurity in many countries of strategic importance in the United States will increase. In some countries, declining food security will almost certainly contribute to social disruptions or large-scale political instability or conflict, unquote. This concern that growing world food insecurity and climate-driven price spikes from rising temperatures and diminishing rainfall will generate widespread instability and conflict continues to permeate U.S. strategic calculations. For example, it is evident in the worldwide threat assessment delivered each year to Congress by the Director of National Intelligence on behalf of the National Intelligence Council as a whole. In his February 2018 presentation, the current director, Daniel R. Coates, stated that, quote, extreme weather events in a warmer world will 
uh, the potential for greater impacts and can compound with other drivers to raise the risk of humanitarian disasters and conflict with food shortages and price shocks playing major contributing roles. David Ramsey Steele, along with the late Julian Simon and others, have said that we will not hear anything about climate disruption in a few years or five or ten years, or whatever time frame they pull out of their climate science denial and climate policy delay hats. Mr. Steele, you cannot expect them to seriously accept that the consideration of world food shortages and climate-driven price spikes on intelligence analysts is just going to dry up and blow away. The intelligence communities perceive links between climate disruption, water and food resource shortages and conflicts are real and credible. Many of the military establishment have previously served in Iraq and Afghanistan and have seen firsthand the impact of water scarcity on hard pressed populations. By contrast, you, Mr. Steele, lack credibility. Michael T. Fair's excellent and highly recommended book, All Hell Breaks Loose, the Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change. It's even more urgency, immediate urgency to accelerate the use of non-fossil fuel and non-nuclear energy strategies. Please join me for my keynote birthday event, my event here April 18th. Attacking simultaneously our climate and extinction crises while pushing for a non-nuclear future. I'll show that nuclear power is actually our worst possible choice. It'll actually make climate disruption a lot worse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I am very glad that we learned how to burn fossil fuels. I am very glad that we were able to burn this stuff and to learn how to use it and use it well. Why? Because there's something you're all forgetting that's happened over the last 300 years. We're all living longer. We're all getting educated. Our economy's getting better. And personally, I'd much rather be living today than 300 years ago as a farmhand. You know, today we have the luxury of talking about climate change. And what we're doing is we've been innovating our way forward to produce a better life for well over 250 years, done through free trade and free market capitalism, I may add. The thing, the point of the matter is this. You know, if we have a booming economy, we can focus on green technology to get our way out of out of many dilemmas. You know, sometimes when we're talking about green technology, sometimes green technology brings us better to help solve global climate change. Why? Once we get a little more richer under our belts, the world citizenry gets a little bit more wealthier, they'll be able to move and be able to handle the climate change disruptions better. Right now, less people uh, have problems with climate survival. I mean, you know, where we have people dying from earthquakes and everything else than we did in the 19. We have less people doing it because of the 19 than we did in the 1950s. Why? Our predictive models are becoming better because of space technology. And what gets rockets into space? Fossil fuels. I tell you, know, I can see that we need to stop doing it. And I agree with Mr. Steele. Probably if you're really wanting to reduce the carbon dioxide in this planet, you better start thinking about nuclear. There's no way we're going to do it with 100% renewables, even if the price comes down. Remember, it takes well over a thousand wind turbines spaced over the, uh, the state the size of Vermont to replace one nuclear power plant. And then you also have to have the backup storage for it. So for me, I'm for technology. I'm for innovation. I am not for a socialistic Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is a bunch of what I call green foolery. Thank you. A couple of observations that uh, nobody else has made so far. History, 40 years ago, Avery Levins published this book, Avery and Hunter Levins, Energy and War, Breaking the Nuclear Link. 
This is a summary of the work of thousands of scientists. If you don't have time to read 50 or 100 books, search this out. Copies are available on the internet for three bucks, four bucks, five bucks. In this book describes how globally nuclear power gives us less energy than burning firewood. Nuclear power is irrelevant to the survival of the future of the human race, for one thing. Nuclear power is the most expensive method known to man to boil water. And the current studies show that a megawatt uh, of nuclear electricity is about $100 at current prices. A megawatt of wind power is about 40 and a megawatt of solar is about 50 to 45 dollars and coming down. Solar and wind power are today cheaper than nuclear power. Both are falling and nuclear is rising. So that's one thing. Number two, there's an old saying, the emperor has no clothes, the cat's out of the bag, it's time to throw in the towel. Well, it's time to stop denying and tolerating the de denying of people that are paid to tell us that we have to burn fossil fuel everywhere to warm up things to uh, make the human race uh, an easier way to survive on the planet. Um, the last 200 years with a correlation, the correlation between the rise in temperature and the melting, increasing melting of the glaciers and everything else is the correlation with the increase of burning fossil fuels, human activity, especially fossil fuel all over the world. Those two graphs pretty much go up together, and as um, Ted said, it's a sharp spike, a blink in the eye. All we have to do to ensure that our kids have no future beyond about, no viable future beyond 2060, is to keep talking about irrelevant things that happened millions of years ago when humans weren't even on the planet. We have to look at the problems right now. Uh, is it from the Civil War? Does anybody know where this, if you know, where does the saying come from? Don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Was that when people were riding horseback? Revolutionary War. Soldiers? That's the Revolutionary War, right? Yeah. Well, if you don't shoot until you see the whites of the eyes of an incoming cruise missile, you're seconds away from being vaporized. <laughs> and if you don't shoot and see the whites of the eyes of uh, global warming, rising up around you, that, that's, that's like waiting until the hot breath of the horse is right in your face and you're being trampled by its hooves. You have to take a look at situations that are developing and, and look at the science. The science is overwhelming that we're in the middle of global warming and the solutions, incidentally I'll leave you with one last fact, 10,000 times more light falls on the planet every day in energy from that free reactor out there than all the energy used by the human race. We collect one ten thousandth of the solar energy. We don't even need any wind or wave power. We are bathed in free energy for the Green New Deal all over the planet, all day, every day. Thank you. We both would be, I would like to thank first of all both of our speakers as well by gave informative presentations. However, in the case of David Ramsey Steele, with all due respect to Dr. Steele, I would say the following. With regard to those folks who say there's no such climate thing as climate change, my answer is horse shit. Of course there is climate change. You can see it in the way that the glaciers are melting. You can see it in the fact that the polar bears are now, are now at least a vulnerable species who are finding it harder and harder to get food in the Arctic. And you can see it the way the sea level is rising. The fact that the Maldive Islands are practically all underwater at this point, or, or nearly so. And the fact that seawater is starting to creep into the, into the drinking water supplies in Miami. No, I'm sorry, global, or I should say, climate change, whether we like it or not, is here. And for those folks who say, well, Al Gore is a bomb and he's a liar, it doesn't matter. He's pointing out something that is truly, as he says, an inconvenient truth. Climate change is here whether we like it or not. Now with regard to the moon landing, sorry Ted, I happen to believe that yes, we actually went to the moon. And while you delivered your talk last summer saying it was a hoax, I sat home watching on PBS the American Experience presentation on chasing the moon. And I saw how we actually got there. And even a radical like Gil Scott Heron in his poem, Whitey on the Moon, 
acknowledged, if not the wisdom, at least the reality of the moon landing. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, surprised you by the CIA, right? You watch CIA. So, uh, uh, I appreciate the speakers. I, it's always fun to hear debates. I tend to side more with uh, Ted. Uh, ignoring the uh, chemtrail argument, uh, I really enjoyed a lot of the science graphs that were presented for, related to global warming. There was one thing I wanted to add, because I don't think I heard you mention this, is there's a big concern about from climatologists about the fact that it's quite possible that this global warming trend can accelerate. Okay, as, as, as if this isn't bad enough, it can actually accelerate for a couple of reasons. One is you have all this uh, melting. The melting can actually accelerate because water under the glaciers acts as sort of a lubricant that accelerates the movement of the glaciers towards the ocean. The other thing is um, uh, you have so much tundra in the northern hemisphere, and in that frozen ground is methane, a lot of methane. And they're reporting in Russia how there are huge chunks of the tundra that are collapsing. All of it's going into the air, so they're really con they, they they're trying to figure out how to guesstimate and how this is going to have an effect. Um, there's uh, one thing that uh, Dr. Steele mentioned at the beginning of his talk, uh, where he said people are kind of born to be in hot climates, and um, uh, and I thought I'd share my experience with that. It it's uh, the first off is I'm a big fan of history. I read about. Uh, uh, explorers, the early explorers who went to South America and the tip of South America and found Indians who were literally standing almost bare naked while it was sleeting. And they were shocked because there's steam coming off their bodies. And there's also stories about early settlers in North America who uh, had the same experience with natives who were very, barely dressed. And, um, uh, and that, that, that always stuck with me. And then I discovered somebody online, and I'm not making this up. Anybody can fact check me. There is a man named Vim Hoff. It's spelled, his first name is spelled W-I-M, and his last name is spelled H-O-F. And I'm sorry if this is slightly off topic. It's not directly related to global warming, but I find it fascinating about the capacity of human beings. Uh, they called him the Iceman. He's from the Netherlands, and there are videos of him and he set records because he's able to control his body temperature. Uh, what he's basically discovered is through different uh, meditation practices, he's able to control his body temperature. Um, humans have two kinds of fat, white fat and brown fat. Brown fat is pretty rare. Um, it's not much in the body, but it's, very, it's directly related to the of temperature and he's able to set these records where he can sit in literally a bucket of ice for an hour and his body temperature, his core temperature goes up. So uh, basically uh, the, the argument is that um, human beings have this capacity to control their temperature. Just because we're not covered with fur doesn't mean that we're designed for uh, for uh, hot temperatures. Now, the, the point, that the, the reason I bring this up is because is that Ms. Uh, Dr. Steele, is, I think he's trying to make arguments that sound truthful. Oh, human beings, they're made for only hot temperatures. Well, that's not really true. And you can fact check me. Look up Wim Hof online. And it's the same way, as in, and it's comparable to his argument that uh, CO2 is good for uh, it's good. Why? It feeds the plants. If you really believe that, buy a big barrel of oil, put it in back your backyard, light the whole thing on fire, and go feed your plants. <laughs> uh, tonight we've been kind of like a bunch of uh, blind men walking around, knowing that there is a problem but not quite knowing how we're going to go about solving it. Uh, clearly, we can't live in quite the environment that we've lived in for the last five or six hundred years. 
our environment will not sustain it. I'm not an ecologist, I'm not an expert of those things, but the fact of the matter is we are seeing <coughs> uh, all kinds of strange phenomena occurring in the Arctic and even to a degree in the Antarctic. We're finding polar bears dying prematurely. We're finding icebergs breaking apart where they were very solid at one point. We're finding Eskimos nearly starving to death because they can no longer get their sustenance in the way that they used to. Now, <clears throat> clearly we have a problem. And clearly, as uh, someone here, at least one person suggested, we need to probably have a latter day Manhattan Project where we bring in all of the experts everywhere from the Pentagon to you know where, wherever, lock everybody up, say, okay, we're going to go into, you know what a conclave is, like in Rome when they name a pope, everyone is locked in and no one gets out until someone is picked. Well, in this case, maybe we need some kind of a conclave where these guys are locked up, they're given food, but the food ration goes down a little bit every week until finally they, they get really serious about this and get something done. Um, look, we're not on the brink, we're not on the brink of Armageddon, we're not on the brink of, you know, uh, going down the tube. We have options, but to use those options, we need to have the intelligence of getting everyone with any kind of skill that can be used, sit down, pool ideas together. It may take a year, pool ideas together, and then come up with a program uh, to deal with the problem. About uh, five or six years ago, I was uh, at a luncheon, and uh, seated next to me was a retired general. And we got into a conversation, and he said, uh, Pat, where do you think the next war is going to start? The next serious war. And I said, probably, probably uh, in uh, Russia or whatever, because they've got a great deal of uh, oil. And he says, no, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a water. We're going to fight over water. And the countries which are going to be the countries that are in a position to decide who gets the water are going to be the United States and Canada. The Great Lakes, for example, are the largest body of water that you could drink from right away. And uh, so we're going to have to be very, very good friends with the Canadians. They're going to have to be good friends with us. Fortunately, the Canadians are very easy people to deal with if you deal with them decently. We're going to have to learn to deal with some of our neighbors a little bit less cavalierly than we were doing in the past. All I'm saying is that, yes, uh, we have a problem. Global warming, in one form or another, is here. But it needn't bring us to the point of no return. We still have time. It's time for us to sit down, get serious, do something about it, and remember. Remember, if nothing else, that the sheer, the, the, per, the proper and fastest way to peace is prosperity. How we do that, how we have as many people living prosperous, diminishes the likelihood of a serious war. And I have just gotten the no. signal to go. <laughs> <laughs> we were like two minutes over. Are you yeah. We got a lady over here. Um. <clears throat> Okay, I'll stop. Hi, uh, I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I love this uh, uh, 
free speech forum. It's made a big difference uh, because it's the solution, really. Um, it, it actually helps to learn the disinformation so that we know how, what we need to focus on correcting. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't like, you know, didn't like being, you know, accusing um, Dr. Steele of, of being a fascist, but uh, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of, I'm seeing the pattern and practice, unfortunately, of, of fascism, and it, it really, I'm basically a social scientist. I, you know, try to understand history, forensic historian, and uh, there's a pattern in practice primarily that explains this. And, um, you know, this uh, harp, you know, at what causes this? It, it um, you know, it, I guess, uh, I don't think everybody can always see that there is a cause, um, a person, a, a sinister, um, and it really, it just has to be kind of evil fascist force that is uh, pulling out these big lies and this disinformation. It, it you know, it did, it, but the sad thing is most of us uh, just assume we've got information. And so it makes it very hard to correct the record because they're, the dis, the deregulators, the libertarians, the um, Ian Rand and Milton Friedman and this whole, you know, it's Thank lipstick you. on fascism, uh, neoliberalism, neoconservatism, neofascism, neofederalism. They're all basically started with the Cold War and it's, they're, it's Hitler, uh, Carl Schmidt caused it, called it his, uh, the leave behind armies, the strategy of tension you know terrorism let's divide and conquer everyone through terrorist attacks through um fueling both sides of the war you know um like there's a um uh, you know this school blows up and that you know thing blows up and blame it on the other guy look at the pattern they're always blaming it on the other guy do they ever take responsibility for themselves doing it it when it's cleared up like the liberty that the israelis bombed it they cover that up. Every time it comes out that, right. that they did it, it's covered up. They killed people in flotillas. So, you know, I grew up with a, a, a stepfather who believed this stuff, and I always kind of said, okay, well, you wouldn't lie to me. But he was misinformed. And it's called revisionist history, revisionist Zionism. And we're getting into, you know, since 1940s and before that, we're, you know, we're having to correct this. We need a right to the tr historical truth. And um, the, I think what I've learned, I know from my stepfather, you know, climate, uh, you know, global warming is a religion. You're a utopian. I mean, this is what the fascists said to the socialists and the communists. Okay. So, uh, you know, we, we've got to see things for our own eyes. All right. Unless we have one more rebutter, we're going to have to get time to get our speakers going. All right, Charlie, strict three-minute limit, please. Well, I'm going to be like, like that other guy. I'm just going to declare my own time. That's not how I run things. You just declare your own time. No, we don't. Your own rules. Anyhow, let's thank both our speakers. Thank you, Ted, for your putting together. I'm going to put on your PowerPoint, and David, for uh, giving us your thing here. I'll be very explicit. He hasn't given me much time. So um, I agree with Ted on virtually all of everything there, uh, including the uh, change, this difference between weather and climate. Yeah, there's just certainly evidence of efforts to control weather, whether or not that changes the climate. I have to say something I've never heard before. Um, the thing about the, the plant, the, the continents coming apart from Pangea and movement of the tectonic plates has absolutely nothing to do with the climate of the Earth. Uh, the tectonic plates are stationary. I mean, they move with maybe a couple inches, and that has no effect upon either the climate or the weather or the earth. I have no idea what this 
Isthmus of Panama concept is controlling the climate. It's a, a relatively low-lying piece of land, and to say that this is some sort of barrier or demarcation line between the weather of the Earth, uh, I, this is not the Himalaya Range. This is not the expanse of the ocean. This is a, a little. 25 foot wide jungle that isn't a barrier to anything at all except the navigation by ships, which we've taken care of by digging a ditch across it. Uh, just to so let you know, and although I'm not a capitalist, I will go to an advertisement for upcoming programs that we're going to be talking at. In March, we're going to have two programs on on green issues. Um, the Illinois Green Party candidate will be here, as well as the Zeitgeist Movement, which uh, has a, an approach to sustainability. And we're going to have three full programs in April on different ecological issues. So, but once again, thank you both. Uh, please come again, gentlemen, uh, and thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, our speakers get the. Oh, we're gonna go one. Yeah, just keep three minutes. One more minute. Okay. Three minutes. Three minutes. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. All right, ninety seconds. I just suggest to everybody, go to your on Google and take a look at the timeline of the glaciation, and you'll see the last ten thousand years of almost a straight line now going up. And it's gone down just a little. So everything that Dr. Steele said is true, and it has absolutely no bearing on human beings on this planet at all. But I would like to suggest to you that I don't think we have any problems. I just think we have circumstances we're facing, and that is the global climate is going to change. Nothing we can do about it. There's way too many of us here. We're not going to make it really the way we are. So we might want to just consider it a circumstance in how we're going to adjust to it, as opposed to a problem that we're going to solve. Some problems, all problems, could be solved. Circumstances can't be. You just deal with it. And I think that's where we're at. And as far as capitalism, it works. And prosperity, it works. If Mike can need, get it done. One fool. If we had the rest of this planet without any increase at all in population, living like we do, we would need three planets, and that's not hyperbole. You would need three more planets to feed them, clothe them, make automobiles, generate electricity, heat, a heat sink. And then the last thing that really is the huge problem is global masking. You've got all this coal putting sulfur in the air, which is reflecting heat just like steel would probably agree with. The problem is you take it out, you got the heat we're generating that's being kept in, and now you're gonna let in all the rest of the heat that's being reflected right now because of coal burning. So the circumstances are there, we just gotta adjust. So I think we should maybe have a forum one day about what are we gonna do, or what is the next generation gonna do, and how are they gonna live? It's certainly not like this, and that's a point. Just all right. Uh, our speakers get it. Are any more rebutters? Our speakers get the last word. Where's David? Oh, there's right there. David's, he's right there. David, get first. you going to talk about the. Um, Each of you get about three minutes apiece to final remarks, please. Um, some of these comments were very right on, um, some of them were off. Um, like uh, Tim, um, we might have better lives in many ways, but our lives uh, are not all, all that great in other ways. And certainly, plants and animals are taking a huge hit. And one reason for it is global warming. And that's, we're in the middle of a mass extinction, a sixth mass extinction. That's extremely serious business. Uh, another, uh, this gentleman uh, mentioned that um, there are, uh, there's acceleration of global warming, and there are feedbacks, and it's going to get, 
if not already, it, it might very well get out of control completely. We might be on our way to a complete melting of all ice, and if not a, a, another Venus. You know, you know, Venus has a carbon dioxide atmosphere, and it's a hell, literally uh, a, a 800 degrees Celsius hell or something like, or Fahrenheit, whatever, but just a burning hell. So things are very serious with this global warming. And they're very serious with, with chemtrails as well. Chemtrails is a massive poisoning of, of, of all life on Earth. It's every freaking day, practically. You look up and you, and you see toxic waste covering our skies, Talk to chem clouds, chem, chem skies, OK? This is serious business. So just generally speaking, these are very serious issues and problems. And even if they weren't, strictly speaking, problems that we can't handle, we aren't handling them. Things are being done for the benefit of uh, corporations, of the very rich. Uh, the oil companies are the ones that benefit most uh, from denying global warming. We have to get control over our society, over this planet, how it's treated, OK? We have a responsibility. Uh, and, but we don't, we'll only be able to have control if we change our political systems, our, our governments. Uh, right now, they are run by the plutocrats. Uh, to benefit the plutocrats, they control the politicians like puppets on a string. Okay, so we have, that's the first thing that we have to change if we're going to make any changes on anything uh, of you know of importance in this in this society, in this country, and in this world. Okay, Mr. Steele. Yeah. Go ahead, you can go. Go ahead. You can go. Yeah. We. Hey, is anybody able to give people some people rides tonight? Yes. Ed needs a ride. He does. I could use one. Uh, Charlie, I'll take you, Mr. Steele, and uh, Dave Holm. Anybody else? Well, you need a ride, don't you, Pat? Uh, I can travel with uh, the uh, We'll figure sure. something out. What, what, what's the question? Uh, who needs rides? I, I have a car. You have a car? You take it home? Okay. We'll figure out, we'll figure out rides after Mr. Steele. All right, thank you. Okay. We'll make sure nobody gets home cold tonight. Go ahead, so, sir. Um, the term climate change is really a kind, is kind of redundant because climate always changes. It never stops changing. Uh, uh, climate has been changing for millions of years. It's been changing by the decade, by the century, by the millennium. Um, it's been changing by the million years. It's always changing. Um, and uh, nothing, nothing can stop climate change. Um, so the whole idea that climate change is some kind of threat, well, it may be a threat because it may do things that are inconvenient, uh, but um, it's, not some, it's not something, it's like gravity, it's just there, climate always changes. Um, what I find when I listen to people who accept this whole belief system uh, of catastrophic global warming is that they speculate about the future, they don't examine their speculations very critically, and then they start talking as though these things are already happening. Uh, and, and, and basically, they're not happening. For example, extreme weather events have been getting less over the past 50 years. Decade by decade, extreme weather events get less. This is what you would expect with warming, because the warmer it gets, the fewer extreme weather events there will be. Um, so um, I can prove that to you if anybody's interested. Um, so. Uh, one thing you have to understand about warming and cooling of the Earth is when the Earth warms, it doesn't happen uniformly. It happens close to the poles and hardly at all close to the equator. So what happens is the temperature becomes more the same all over the, all over the Earth. That's what happens when it warms. When it gets colder, uh, the temperature becomes more different, and that's why you get more extreme weather events. Glaciers, they shrink a bit when it warms, and they've been shrinking for the past 300 years. They grow a bit when it gets cold. Uh, and um, uh, the glaciers we're talking about are all new glaciers. They're not glaciers that existed a few thousand years ago. They're glaciers that have come into existence because of the cooling of the Earth over the past few thousand years. Polar bears, the population's at an all-time high. Um, uh, you, can, you can look at a picture, of, uh, a faked picture of a polar bear standing on an ice floe. Polar bears can swim. 
uh, a healthy adult male can swim 100 miles. Uh, polar bears survived the uh, medieval warm period, which was hotter than today. They survived the Roman warm period, which was hotter than the medieval warm period. They survived the Minoan warm period, and they survived the, the Holocene optimum. So they've been through warmer things than today and survived, so we should expect them to survive. Um, <clears throat> Well, if you reject the theory that the movement of land masses can affect climate, uh, then you have to explain why, after uh, being comparatively warm, the Earth suddenly got very cold uh, 2.6 million years ago. Why did that happen? Uh, so uh, th there's a problem for you. It used to be a lot warmer, and we're living in an ice age today um, because of um, something that happened uh, nearly 3 million years ago. OK, thank you. One last, one last. Plate tectonics uh, does, Rich Charlie, plate tectonics does have a huge effect on, on climate over the millions of years. So there's no question about that. Okay. That is uh, true. All right, both you guys gavel us out. Okay. Uh, all right, thanks for coming. Have a good night. And we'll all right, have a good night and have a good week. And we'll see you next week.